everyone, Nick Baxter. Thanks, guys. Thank you for being here. The start of this seminar, it's, it uh, started several years ago, um, just from a thought I had about uh, when you gain sort of notoriety as an artist, like in the tattoo industry and as a fine artist painter, you always find people asking you to critique their work. And um, I thought, I had the thought one day that I should try to teach the actual skills of critique so that people could take that skill home with them and um, feel empowered to do it in their own shops if you all are tattooers, like in, in your own tattoo shops uh, with your colleagues and whoever. <laughs> and um, so it started as a lengthy article that myself and uh, fellow artist and tattooer Teresa Sharp wrote. I don't know if you guys are all familiar with Teresa Sharp. She is an incredible tattooer and artist. Um, has an art school education, and unfortunately she's not here at this event, but she's been at past ones. But anyways, we got together and collaborated on this lengthy 12-page article uh, called Evaluating Art, the Principles of Critique. And um, my whole goal with the project, and she was totally on board with it, was to sort of capitalize on the like Wikipedia concept of like open sourced knowledge and information and just like bringing it to the masses so that everyone can improve on it in their own way and use it towards their own purposes. So um, for the past three or four years, it's been hosted for free. I'm on my website, nickbaxter.com uh, in, in its entirety and anyone can go up there and just download a PDF of it. And uh, I'm gonna give the link of that at the end of this uh, presentation in case any of you don't know about that or haven't downloaded it yet. And uh, the printout that was on your seats is just a very boiled down, shortened, condensed version of the major uh, points that I'm gonna be talking about and going through with this presentation, just so you guys don't have to be confused or I don't have to keep like switching back to the previous slide. <clears throat> so anyways, that was the spirit behind this whole project. Um, because I always find that being asked for critiques at these events, it's like time is so limited and um, my energy is also limited. So it's hard to like get to everyone or really like devote the proper like time and attention to like get to know any one of you as an artist and like what you're all about. Um, and there's an important di distinction between opinion-based critique and actual knowledge and fact-based critique. And a lot of real quick critiques that happen just off the cuff, like, oh, look at my work. I felt like a lot of those um, boil down to opinion rather than actual usable, tangible knowledge that you can take with you and act on in, in the future and make yourself a better artist. Um, I personally went to art school, and I don't know if any of you did, but a lot of times what happens in art school with professors is they mold the students in their image based on their limited set of opinions and knowledge. Um, I paint this way, therefore I'm gonna teach you to paint this way, and this is the right way and the wrong way. And so I feel, I feel like a lot of critiques kind of dive into that territory of like, this is just my opinion. It may not be right or wrong or good or bad, but um, the person asking for the critique kind of takes that as like literal truth and fact. And so um, it's, le it's, it's less empowering. It doesn't give them knowledge to make their own choices moving forward, so anyhow. So I tried to make this presentation as short as possible because we only have an hour. Um, and you can have access, like I said, to the full article, so you can, which goes into way more detail and depth than this is gonna go through. But I'm all about the proper mindset about doing anything. I love the mental aspect of life and about doing anything. So the proper mindset um, for a really good critique is to create, obviously, first and foremost, a safe emotional environment of mutual respect. Um, a lot of times, this is a problem I, I find in, like in tattoo shops especially, they kind of tend to have a real like ball busting, joking a atmosphere like among people who work there. And a lot of times that can be very intimidating to someone who wants to like be vulnerable and show this thing they created and get like real feedback on it. So, um, although that's probably a very obvious point of, of course you want to be respectful of the people you're critiquing. I, I feel like a lot of people may joke and like bust balls in a way that isn't conducive to the 
person asking for the critique to really learn something. So, um, and plus, like all the panelists said last night, if, if you guys were here for the discussion panel, um, every piece of art you make is a self-portrait. There's a lot of yourself in it, whether you intend or whether you like that or not. And so it's scary to put yourself out there and ask someone for, for, for guidance or for, or for their thoughts on your work. So um, the second part of that kind of safe emotional environment is taking the opinions out of it and just creating a scientific mindset. Um, we're just evaluating factors on a piece of art. And we're trying to be clinical and precise in our language and in our wording uh, so that there's no confusion and it's less opinion based and it's more fact based so that it can really be a good teaching tool for the person receiving the critique. And of course, uh, it goes without saying that in order to look at a work, to evaluate it, to propose solutions, to make it better for the person who's being critiqued, you gotta have background knowledge of art concepts. And uh, everyone here in this room is probably at different levels in their background art knowledge um, based on however much study you've done in your life um, or how much experience you have like using techniques and mediums. So it's just a little asterisk maybe, like a little disclaimer to keep in the back of your mind. Um, you can only give so thorough a critique as your own knowledge that you already possess. So it's important if you guys wanna take this into your own tattoo shops or into your other environments other than here, like always be continuing on your background study of art so that you can better help your peers or whoever you uh, do the critique process with. Um, so I really like using metaphors and I love using house metaphors. I use them in pretty much all my seminars. Um, my tattoo seminar at the Worldwide Tattoo Conference, I have this big like house metaphor that I use. So I made one for this naturally. Um, so step one of the process, and again, just, there's way more detail of this in the actual article. Um, but step one is prepare the ground. And like I just said a few minutes ago, uh, we're trying to get into an analytical mindset and less about like ephemeral feelings and impressions. And, it's, and you're really trying to look for tangible evidence to point out specific things to the person to help them solve a problem that they present you with. Uh, the second part of the critique is just to lay the foundation by simply silently absorbing the work. And uh, we did that actually this morning in Jeff Gogoy's seminar. He just had us look at the screen and absorb the work with the music playing and stuff. So that's basically what you're doing. Um, you don't just rush into your instant opinion or, or impression. You really try to take the piece in and uh, really uh, engage your mind with all the factors that are on the handout that, that you guys got and just go through the list uh, before you eventually engage the artist in a question and answer process, figure out their goals, their intentions, what they had in mind, why they made this choice here and this choice here. And through that question and answer process, that the artist who's being critiqued may say, I'm unsure about this, this is where I need the precise critique. How do I solve this problem with the work? <clears throat> um, so again, so you're sort of building the structure of, of the critique that way and you're all compiling your knowledge and you're learning about the piece. You're not just like judging a book by its cover basically to use another metaphor. You're really like digging in and trying to read that book and discover what the artist had in their mind so that you can better help them. So in a way you're learning to speak their language um, and every artist, every one of us has our own unique artistic language that we're trying to express. And so if I critique your work based on my opinions from my artistic language, that may not help you. Um, and lastly, of course, decorate the interior and propose actual solutions, um, actual steps that they can take, not just, it sucks, I don't like it, or, oh, it's good, good job. You know, obviously those are very unhelpful critiques. So all this just represents the ideal full structure of like a really thorough, in-depth critique. Um, if you're super tight with the people you're critiquing with, if you're very close and you know each other and you know each other's art very well, this may seem overly stiff and formal. And so of course this doesn't need to happen to have a good critique. It's just a good ideal to strive for. And especially in an environment like this where we don't all know each other very well, uh, it's a good idea to keep all this stuff in mind and at least make some attempt to go through the formality of like doing it the proper way. If you're 
interested in helping that person the most. Uh, so again, I, I just, it needs to be reset. Like being, being specific with your wording is very important. Um, choosing precise language, uh, such, such as like if you have to analyze a color blue in a painting and this person's receiving the critique is asking you about that, you need to use very specific language like hue or vibrance or chroma um, or this distinct area right here and point to it. Um, Again, it just sort of sets a more scientific environment of, of, of learning. And uh, it also helps to uh, put everyone like in a strategic mindset. And by strategic, I mean problem solving. Um, the purpose of critique is to solve specific problems within a work and to make that artist better. So again, opinion is definitely not the right way to go about it. Um, let's see, I have these speaking notes that I just wrote an hour ago. So, uh, so if an artist asks you about a specific problem with, within the work, um, and you don't like the work, let's say, like you just don't think it's a good painting, that's okay. But in order to help that person, if you care, obviously you just want to help them solve that problem that they're asking about. And so that, again, is another way to distinguish between opinion and, and fact. Your opinion is you hate their painting, but the specific strategy to help them solve the problem at, at the level that they happen to be at um, is a totally different matter. And so I think a lot of critiques can go awry in that way. P people get the two mixed up, so it's important to uh, Always remember to separate that. And part of the Q&A process um, and, and the sort of dialectic that you form with the artist is that you're trying to discover their intention. And Jeff talked about intention this morning, and that's very important for me, too, as an artist. Um, the more intention you have during the planning and conceiving stages of your work, the better it's going to turn out. Um, Happy accidents and experiments and just fooling around will lead to failure in one or more areas of, of your piece. And so intention is very important. And you could give a whole critique on someone's piece of artwork um, under the false impression that they intend it to be a certain way. And so everything you say to them to correct a certain problem is not going to help them whatsoever because you don't know what they intended with that thing in the first place. So. It's always very important to do, do a little bit of digging and figuring out, w figure out what did you intend here, like why did you do this? Always have reasons. Um, and in my experience with beginner to intermediate level artists, which I include myself in that and probably everyone here too, um, there's always oversights in intention. You, through, through someone taking the time to really like observe your work and go through the criteria, and ask you why, why, why this? What did you intend here? It actually makes you realize, like, oh wow, I kind of overthought that, or I didn't think about that at all. Geez, I mean, yeah, maybe that's why I'm having a problem here, or I'm confused here. Had I thought about it from the beginning, you know, that wouldn't have happened. So I find that's a very common thing, and that's okay. Um, but it's just something to be aware of. Uh, always discover the artist's intention. And if you are the person being critiqued, um, Always, always keep in mind that rule of intention and uh, being intentional with what you did in, in, in your piece. And I think you'll find more often than not that the places where you're stuck or confused is because there wasn't enough premeditated thought and intention put into why you made that choice. So that's great, that's what critiques are for, is, is to help you discover that. And so you, you guys already have seen this on your sheet, but th this is all the basic criteria that Teresa and I came up with, and it's by no means a thorough or complete list. So the whole like Wikipedia concept of open source is like you guys can add to this in your own life mo moving forward if there's other things we overlooked or that are more important to you. Um, but we figured these were pretty foundational important things that just about anyone could benefit from these factors. And once again, this article goes into much detail about all of these that I'm not going to take the time to go through tonight because we'd be here for hours. 
And so, of course, based on this factual criteria that we really can use as measuring sticks, um, we can then propose actual solutions for people. Um, so if there's a problem with discordant color, we can propose a solution of unifying that color either with a glaze or by repainting with one color, and et cetera, and just on down the list. Uh, let me see if I had uh, some notes about that. So one thing that this article explains that, just as a brief aside, uh, that I think is really cool is um, um, an artistic mentor of mine taught me to think of color in terms of music. And uh, each individual color is a note, and using colors together forms chords. And a whole painting could be like a song. And it's actually really cool that Jeff had us listening to music uh, this morning. I thought that was very appropriate and sort of in, in tune with what I was taught. Uh, so there's this concept of color chords, and uh, so when you're analyzing color, it's not just about color theory, but it's about how all the colors harmonize together into a chord, uh, something that looks pleasant, or if it were music, would, would uh, sound pleasant. So just wanted to explain that to you guys, because I think that's a really cool way to enhance your, your, your knowledge and how you work with color. And uh, another interesting thing to mention um, in regards to more representational art or, and even more specifically with realism art, for example, point number two, lack of atmospheric depth, depth or incorrect anatomy, these obviously only apply to realism, to representational art, and it sort of opens up a whole other can of worms because when you propose these solutions like to fix lack of atmospheric depth, um, you need to understand how the Earth's atmosphere works. And you need to understand that there's molecules of oxygen in, in the air that make distant objects appear kind of bluish, purple, and hazy. And so it's interesting that even just in this one discipline of how to critique art, you're calling from all these bodies of, and areas of knowledge that may not, uh, on the surface, have immediate impact and like have to do directly with art, but, um, but you need to call on them in order to give someone a thorough critique and to propose these solutions. So uh, one common problem I find with beginner to intermediate figurative painting is that uh, uh, the figures will look kind of dull and waxy and almost dead, like there isn't enough warmth in them. And so, you really need to understand basic principles of physiology and uh, biology and know that the pinkish glow that Caucasian skin has and um, some other tones of skin is caused by actually light penetrating the slightly translucent layers of skin cells and hitting the blood that's in there and bouncing back to your eye. And so that's what gives the areas of the thin skin like ears, noses, they're, they're always much more red than, than, than you would uh, immediately think. And that's a common flaw in a lot of figurative art. So I just figured I'd go through that and just remind you guys that there's all other bodies of knowledge that you need to call on. Um, and it, a lot of it specifically does have to do with representational or realist art. So if that's your area of focus and you're looking to be critiqued or you're trying to critique in that area, uh, it's just helpful to keep, keep all that stuff in mind. It goes back to the to the point I made before about your overall body of artistic knowledge is gonna help you give better critiques and be better critique to yourself. So I think now we're ready to put this all into practice with an, an example that I picked. Um, just personally, this is one of my favorite painters. Uh, this is Andrew Wyeth. He's an American painter from mid 20th century. Uh, he's now dead. He, he died in, I think, the late or some, sometime in the 1990s. Um, so anyways, he's an American realist painter. And this painting is called Christina's World. And so if we're going to go through the steps of critique, let's just all take a minute to just absorb the piece and sort of glance at your list that you have that I put on your seat and uh, 
Just kind of go through it step by step and just make mental notes. It's not like good or bad or like I like it or I don't like it. We're just recording scientific data with our eyes at this point. So I'm going to run through a bunch of these with you, but first step is always just to take it in and just realize what's happening here with, with this image. So you don't have to do it in the order that I'm about to show you. This just happens to be the order I picked, but first, we can look at the composition of this piece. And this armature is based on classical art from the Renaissance. Um, it has to do with the Pythagorean theorem. And uh, what a bunch of really smart people who are way smarter than me found out was that certain mathematical ratios correlate to visual art and um, create strong focal points that the mind and the eye tends to see as pleasing. Um, Leonardo da Vinci was a fan of this. He was said to use a lot of math in, in, in his composition. And this is all information that exists out in the world that you guys can look up and, and uh, research yourself. It has to do with the Pythagorean theorem and uh, something called the golden ratio. But anyways, so when you're applying this to artistic composition, you're, you're, you're working in halves, in quarters, and in thirds. So lengthwise and widthwise, you're dividing the piece in half, in thirds, and in quarters. And then you're forming diagonal lines from all the corners that go through the piece to the, to the opposite corner and to the halfway points. And the red dots, obviously, as you probably could assume, represent points of strong focus in any composition. And so you can stretch and warp this framework to fit any size or shape canvas, uh, even circular ones. So if this just happened to be a perfectly square canvas and not a rectangle like it is, you would just shrink it uh, widthwise. And all the concepts would still apply. It, it would still be cut in half, thirds, and fourths. So this is just a great way to analyze an artwork, to begin to critique it, because you can see how in tune this artist is, either intentionally or intuitively. Not all artists plan this out in this geometric mathematical way, but um, it is pretty astonishing how your, your natural artistic in intuition will correlate with this, and so that's why this is a thing that exists. Um, so, Andrew Wyeth is a master painter, and whether he intended this or whether he's just this good, it doesn't matter, but you can see how a lot of things perfectly line up on these very important lines and planes of focus. Uh, this strong diagonal all the way through the piece, the model's head is looking along that line, her, point, her foot points down to that. So overall, when we're going through our composi compositional criteria, that's something to take note of. Strong left to right diagonal movement in this piece. He wants your eye to follow this line. Again, whether he in intended it or not, we can't know. But it just goes to show his skill and his mastery that a lot of things in this painting do perfectly match up, and in all of his paintings, if, if you were to do this to all of them. Um, let's see, the these diagonal lines kind of correlate to the, to the lines on the, to the directional lines of this roof. Um, the one-fourth line perfectly coincides with the corner of this building right here. And the chimney, uh, let's see. These tracks in the field roughly correspond to this diagonal line. Um, the crook of her knee right here perfectly corresponds to this very strong focal point. And the more, the more lines intersect, the stronger the focal point. So, again, if we were to take this away, um, it's sort of impossible to like reverse engineer how you originally looked at this painting, but my guess is that you were strongly compelled to, like, to, to follow this directional movement, um, whether you were consciously aware of it or not. But it's cool that we have this tool at our disposal. It just gives us more of an insight into that, in, in, into, way the, in, into the way the eye-mind combination works.
oh, let's see, so very important center line. Her body is entirely to the left of that. The place she's looking at or perhaps wants to go to is entirely on the left. This creates a dramatic sense of distance, of isolation, loneliness, however you want to read it, perceive it, and we're going to get into more of that later. Uh, this mode portion of the field where the grass is shorter comes down to this very important cluster of points and f roughly follows the diagonal back up to the center point. And most importantly, the best part of this, in my opinion, is the most intriguing part of this is that you cannot see her face. It's, you're meant to wonder and, she, and you're meant to be sort of in her shoes, like almost seeing first person through her eyes because she's not looking at you. And it just happens to fall exactly where her eye and her nose would be is exactly on this incredibly important target, the very center of the painting, uh, the exact bullseye. And so, again, whether he intended it or not, whether he's just that good, it's genius in my opinion. So, <clears throat> uh, to use not my opinion, we, we would say that is effective composition. Like, we can factually prove that by applying Pythagorean theorem in math. <clears throat> so, moving on from there, we can also view this painting in terms of color. And I've chosen what I thought were the main colors used in the piece and arranged them according to size and importance. So, like, there's most of the piece is, is these two colors, so they form the majority of the color chord. But the sky is really important because it so strongly contrasts all of this earth tone, so I have it also being important up here. And then you get into these more subtle usages of color, um, pink for her dress, and I kind of like to call that like the pop. There's like this whole limited color and tonal range throughout the whole piece, and then he just makes it pop with a few of these little spot colors. So her dress is like, sort of like the pop that breaks up the monotony of all of this. And I have black over here because her, her, her black hair is again right on the perfect center bullseye of the painting. And we're meant, we're meant to take that in, that's meant to be important to us. We're, we're meant to enter her world, her psychological drama, whatever she has going on. And so the spot of black in all this sea of muted kind of whatever earth tones is obviously very effective because we want to go right there with our eyes. So again, this just shows how you can analyze a piece of artwork in, in terms of color, in terms of relationship, harmony, and again, the concept of the sort of the uh, musical concept that I said about color chords. And again, it's not good. I'm, I'm a fan of this guy's work, so I'm putting my opinions in, into this naturally. But this isn't about opinion or w whether I think this is good or bad. It's just about, it, it, is it effective and do these colors harmonize w with each other? Does it look ugly or does it look like they all belong? And do they all kind of like sing to each other in different notes? Um, if there were like crazy rainbow colors splattered all over the place and this was bright green for no reason and like all that stuff, we would say that's unharmonious and that wouldn't be an opinion. That would be simply based on the factual knowledge of color chords and how colors harmonize based on color theory and the color wheel. Um, this is sort of a skill that is good to learn as an artist and how to, how to picture things in black and white in your mind because we don't always have the luxury of having a computer to put things into grayscale for us. And so this is how you would try to look at this piece in terms of value. And value is really important. It's more important than color because it, it, it's the first step towards determining the readability of any scene of any piece of art. And so I made no changes in Photoshop. I simply just pressed the black and white button to turn what, what was there into, into values. And so with no changes, this is still an incredibly clear, readable composition. Everything is very, still lo looks the way it should and is not confusing. So this, has very strong contrast of values in the part that's meant to be the most important to us. It goes from extreme light to extreme dark, and it doesn't necessarily have that anywhere else in the piece except for maybe right here. 
And that's probably also by design because this is probably the second most important part of the piece. She's here and she's looking perhaps forlornly over here. So we have importance established also, uh, the sort of hierarchy of how we're meant to look at this is this is most important and second most important. And again, nothing clashes or interferes with each other. So that's looking at this piece in terms of value. This is uh, turning the piece into an abstract just to get rid of all the fancy brushwork, all the fancy distracting details, just boil it down to its most simple shapes, colors, and elements. Um, this isn't necessary with all, with all critiques, with all pieces of art, um, but it can help cut through the clutter and the confusion of highly rendered, highly realistic works of art. And so it'll help us more easily determine the spatial relationships between everything, the, the sort of simple geometric shapes that are included in everything, and help us make up our mind about that. And I included these uh, down here in the abstraction because I felt that they were very important because there's all these blades of grass that blend into each other, but he very purposely painted this one really darkly silhouetted and this right here very darkly silhouetted and did that nowhere else in all of the grass. So I felt that he was using those as a compositional element to balance out some of the dark weight that's up here. Again, with that strong diagonal line, this one just so happens to be strategically placed here to sort of balance out the dark, 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 dark. He's also establishing a really good rhythm of value, of dark and light. Um, dark sole of the shoe, light, shadow, light, shadow, light, shadow, light. So this piece is very strong in terms of composition, in terms of its visual rhythm that it leads our eye through. And lastly, so th that's in theory what we would be doing silently to ourselves when we, when we take in the pieces, just running through all those factors the best we can. Then in our Q&A with the artist, and since he's dead, I have also uh, an art critic who spoke about his work. And so through engaging him in a conversation, we would discover all these things about the work and that will further enhance our perceptions of it and how we might help him with the critique that he asked us for. Uh, Glenn Lowry said that a Andrew Wyeth's favorite subjects were the land and the people around him. He spent his summers in Maine where he lived near Christina Olsen, the woman who inspired this painting. She suffered from a neuromuscular disease and eventually lost the ability to walk. So just knowing that one fact, we now have opened ourselves to a whole new world of feeling and uh, knowledge about this piece. <clears throat> we know better where the artist was coming from, why there is such a big distance here why he placed her totally to the left of the center line and this totally to the right of the center line. And of course, in Andrew's own words before he passed was, the challenge to me was to do justice to her extraordinary conquest of a life, which most people would consider hopeless. If in some small way I have been able to, been able in paint to make the viewer sense that her world may be limited physically, but by no means spiritually, then I have achieved what I set out to do. And so if we were to hear that in our Q&A session, if we're like, oh, why'd you put all this space here? And then he started telling us about that, we'd be like, ah, okay. Now I kind of know how to diagnose this painting a little better and maybe troubleshoot with you things that you were unhappy about. And it's kind of funny and, and ironic that I pick a piece that I, in my opinion, I, I consider to be pretty perfect. So like there would be no critique. It'd be like, dude, you nailed it. <laughs> but again, hopefully you guys understand the, the, the concepts of, of all this. And just because it's so cool that like sacred geometry and math gets used in art in ways that we're not really necessarily always, always taught about. I just have a few more e examples of, of that just for fun. <clears throat> and again, it's all based on the Pythagorean theorem and all these ratios. So this is a famous Michelangelo piece. And I mean, so, like I feel like some of these are kind of a stretch, but some of them are pretty dead on, but you know, this roughly coincides with the golden pentagram and these with the golden triangle. Just the way things are spatially arranged in areas of focus that they want to lead your eye to. They all happen to fall miraculously within 
these very specific eye lines. This Rembrandt portrait um, happens to almost perfectly coincide with, uh, with the Golden Triangle. And I don't know, I, I think some of this is kind of a stretch with the Fibonacci sequence here, but apparently some mathematicians have analyzed that painting and that's what they say. But it, it, it's just cool to start to see things in that way. It helps your, your knowledge of composition. And just to give credit where credit's due, I, I, I got all these from an article written by this dude. <clears throat> so just to wrap up this whole presentation, um, it's real easy to critique representational and realist art. It's very concrete. Does it imitate optical reality in a convincing way or in a way that the artist intended or not? Very cut and dry compared to something like this, a Mark Rothko piece. Um, and this kind of goes into some weird territory because the presentation of the piece, the environment that it's put in, is almost import, as important as, as the piece itself. Um, you need, in, in order to give this artist, say Mark Rothko asked us for a critique, we would almost need and require the information to see how big this piece is. It's meant for you to stand in front of it like this woman's doing and just be totally overwhelmed in the warm glow. It's like meant to feel like you're entering the sun. And it's just layer upon layer of, like gla of glazes and him just working out color harmony and color theory. And it's just meant to overwhelm you in that sort of visceral sense. It's not meant to communicate information to you the way representational art is. It's sort of meant to just convey a feeling. So we have to know all this in order to give this guy a proper critique or else you hear the typical thing that everyone says of like, oh, like my three-year-old could have painted that. It's just three squares of color. But that's not what this guy is after. He's after a feeling, uh, a feeling tone and impression and he's trying to overwhelm you with this larger than life glowing red thing that casts this huge reflection on the floor. And so that's just the example about how uh, the way a piece is presented can affect the critique, can affect uh, the way we think about it and the advice or the solutions we give to the artist. Once again, here's another piece where it's, it, it's not subject to the same critique that a piece of realism art such as that Wyeth painting is. We need to give this an entirely different critique. We need to speak this artist's language. And many of you probably know this is Andy Warhol. And um, he made pop art that was a comment on mass consumerism, on mass production, on industrial society. And so this piece is more about its concept than it is about its craft. It's, it's, it's just a screen print. It was probably an, only one of an edition of many. Like he, he probably, I'm pretty sure he printed like a whole bunch of these. So his, his, his very process of mass production is meant to comment on the cheap mass production of the sort of plastic society that we now live in. So if we're critiquing this artwork, we can't be like, dude, this eye doesn't look realistic. You know, like that, that doesn't help that guy. So. I'm just putting this style of artwork up here to once again show that each critique is unique to the language that that artist is trying to speak to you. And he might, he might only ask us if he achieved his conceptual goal, if we take away the meaning that he intended from this piece. That might be the only thing he's concerned with. He may not be concerned with craftsmanship or uh, doing a perfect silk screen with no little bubbles or something, you know? So. Again, any piece of artwork can be critiqued. Um, we can propose solutions to the artist. Um, and it's important not to get into the opinionated mindset of like, I don't personally like pop art, therefore this sucks. <clears throat> and w once again, here's a George Seurat painting from the Neo-Impressionist period. This guy basically created the genre of pointillism. He pointed he, he painted in tiny points of colored paint, just stippling in other words. And he was concerned with the way light works with the human eye and so he was very in tune with color theory. And so we have to know all this context around this piece to give it a proper critique and to properly take it in. And so you can apply all this anytime you go to an art museum, to an art gallery. Um, bring that list with you even and start to really practice this stuff and I think you'll be able to do a better job 
uh, critiquing your own artwork, which is most important because we don't have the luxury all the time of having a really supportive group of close friends and artists who are on our same level of artistic knowledge to give us feedback and stuff. So um, that was the main point of why I wrote this article and why I'm doing this presentation. And uh, this is where it's located on my website. And um, over the years, I've, in, in the spirit of the sort of anarchist ideal of sharing freely and the sort of open sourced Wikipedia concept, I've invited anyone who's bilingual to translate it into non-English languages. And so you'll find up there, there's like six other versions now, and I'm always on the hunt for any other bilingual people who are willing to put the time in and be very generous and help me get it translated into all languages so it can all be hosted on my website and anyone from around the world who's part of our community can benefit from it. So Spanish is the second most spoken language on the planet, I think, or maybe the first, I don't know. And I don't have a Spanish translation, so that sucks. Um, so if anyone knows anyone who meets all, the, meets all the requirements to be able to do that, please get in touch. So anyways, that's it. Um, hopefully you guys learn something from that. Uh, I'm not sure wh how we're doing on time. We have time, were you gonna, is, why do you ask? Because I don't know if guys still want to critique people or what nope. is happening. But um, if, you're, if you're finished, um, Guy did want to make an announcement when you were finished. Okay. So yeah, I guess that's it. Thanks guys. <laughs>